These people are celebrating the first anniversary of their lives together. They all share a passion for the same thing. And they're not the only ones. There's just something about it, you know, you just can't put it into words, you know. It's a classic. It, everything about it is right. I just think they're wonderful. Yeah, they're all that Pratt and Whitney Wasp engine. Oh, absolutely a joy to my ears. There's still a lot around. They haven't been replaced. There isn't an aeroplane that takes their place. He said, take her down to 500 feet, Jim, follow the river and look for crocodiles. Don't you think it's beautiful? I do. And the object of all that affection, that obsession, that adulation, call it what you will, is this, the DC. DC-3, the Dakota, the C-47, the Goonie Bird. Whatever name you have for it, it's alive and well and now entering its sixth decade of active service. The story begins 50 years ago with this letter. The writer, Jack Fry of Transcontinental and Western Airlines, TWA. It was sent to Donald Douglas, the head of the Douglas Aircraft Corporation. And it was the birth certificate for the plane which would revolutionize air transport around the world. When Fry wrote that letter in 1932, the only type of aircraft around that could fly 10 or more passengers was unwieldy, cumbersome, inefficient, slow and noisy. TWA was looking for a new aircraft with a top speed of 185 miles per hour and a maximum operating height of 21,000 feet. Although the original specification was for a tri-motored machine, Douglas, ever a man for efficiency, was able to design an aircraft which could do the job with two. Hughes was impressed and Douglas was awarded the contract. He was to build the Douglas Commercial One, the DC-1. On September the 13th, 1933, Douglas handed over the first plane to TWA at a cost of $65,000. During its lifetime with TWA, the DC-1 established eight new flying records and broke five world records, including the American coast-to-coast -coast speed record. The TWA's new flagship was proclaimed as the shape of things to come. But even while the DC-1 was being made, the follow-up was already on the drawing board. Only one DC-1 was built, the production model was designated the DC-2. The first of 225 DC-2s was delivered to TWA on May the 14th, 1934. Later in 34, a competitor appeared on the scene. American Airlines approached Douglas to provide the world's first sleeper transport. Douglas duly obliged. The wings of a DC-2 were enlarged, the fuselage lengthened, 16 bunks installed, and it was luxury aloft. And by taking those bunks out, 24 seats could be put in. And so was born the most successful plane in the world, the DC-3. They had no bad habits that I can remember. We used to take them up sometimes on an air test, as it was called, when they'd had um, maintenance, and try and cut the throttles right back, hold the stick in your stomach like that, and it used to just wallow, wallow. It would not flick or stall. No bad habits. It's not sophisticated. It won't fall apart. It was built from the right materials. There was no tricky stuff in it. 
I mean, British aeroplanes, you change spars like you change a shirt. Uh, DC-3 doesn't have a spar. It's got millions of little bolts all the way around the wings. Well, millions. It's got about 620, because I've changed them all. And it's just a damn good piece of machinery. I mean, it's a classic. There'll, be, there'll never be anything like it. And what was it that made this such a special flying machine? Well, basically, it was the first ever large all-metal transport plane. Until then, the small planes that have been used were basically metal tubing covered with fabric. You remember that the original specification from our man, Mr. Fry, called for a tri-motor machine. Well, in the end, two engines were found to be adequate. Not only that, but there was enough power in just one of these engines to keep the plane up. And the propellers were an important factor in this. The DC-3's propellers were the first that not only went round and round, but they could, in fact, be twisted backwards and forwards. And so you could increase or decrease the amount of resistance to the wind. And that meant, in effect, that this plane now had a gearbox. Moving down to the wheels, these large low-pressure tyres meant that an aircraft, even on this size, could now land on grass or even on mud. The wing structure was something new as well. Under this strip, there are 760 nuts and bolts, and they served just one purpose, to keep this wing fastened onto the body. And it meant that should a problem arise, overnight, a wing like this one could be replaced. The overall shape with its low-slung wings, which, as you may have gathered by now, sends some people into rhapsodies, was not only beautiful, but it had a practical purpose as well. It meant that should disaster strike and the plane had to come down on water, it could float like a raft. Nowadays, we take it for granted, but back in the 1930s, the Dakota was the first aircraft to give standing headroom. Not only that, but crucial in view of the amount of hours you are now able to fly, the DC-3 was the first plane with its own toilet, basic though it was. The DC-3 was the first two to have air hostesses, and the first airborne meals were served from around here. This is where the passengers sat. Some airlines carried around 14 in luxury, others, BEA for example, crammed in around 32, but as you can see there wouldn't have been much legroom. This one's been kitted out for parachutists, and more of that later. And this is where the pilot sits, and the original pilots were among the first to keep in regular radio contact with the ground. Another innovation, the DC-3 also boasted a duplicate set of flight controls, so that when the pilot wanted to take a rest, as he invariably did on the mammoth trips that they had in those days, he could hand over to his co-pilot. And this is the pilot's best friend, George, the autopilot. And it meant that both pilots could take a rest. Pretty basic compared with the autopilots of the 1980s, but nevertheless functional enough to make life a lot easier for the pilots of the 30s. But the cockpit wasn't all good news. It wasn't even watertight. And many of the pilots who reported back, heavy rain outside, light rain inside. Although it was civil transport that was responsible for the birth of the DC-3, it was the Second World War that brought about its amazing growth. It was General Eisenhower who said that the four things most responsible for the Allied success in Europe and in Africa were the jeep, the bulldozer, the two and a half ton truck, and the C-47. The C-47 was the military version of the DC-3. It was in constant use as a transport plane, and it became crucial in 1944, first in June for the Normandy invasion, then in September at Arnhem. On the early morning of September the 17th, 1944, 161 Dakotas, some towing gliders, some carrying parachutists, took off for Arnhem in Holland in the biggest airborne operation ever mounted. The scene was recreated for the film A Bridge Too Far, using 31 Dakotas borrowed from governments and private sources from throughout the world. It was the largest gathering of DC-3s in the last 25 years. certainly brings back memories. Those are the sort of chaps you see we used to drop out of this Dakota, as we called it. Yeah. 
Did, I, you, did you enjoy flying it? Oh, it was a piece of cake flying these things. Very relaxing, very stable, very airworthy. How often did you go to Arnhem? I think I made about five trips. I can't remember if it was four or five. I went on the first day with a glider, six hours it took to get there and back. Second day with a glider, and then two resupplies. And then I think it was the third resupply, I got shot down. You also involved on D-Day? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, why am I laughing about this? I don't know, it all seems so silly. Now, but D-Day was marvelous. The first night, I took a, a heavy loaded glider, which was supposed to land at an exact spot just inside France, so they could knock out some bridges or something. And unfortunately, I couldn't find the exact spot. So I did what we call tooled around a bit, trying to find it. When I realized, I came face to face with all my friends coming in, I said to this glider pilot, you know, we could talk to them through the rope. I said to him, you better go. So he said, goodbye. I said, good luck. And he went. And he, within an hour, he was a prisoner of war. Poor chap. Supply problems in Europe, difficult as they may be at times, almost fade into insignificance when compared with the war in Burma. New film has just arrived, showing supplies being dropped by the RAF to the 5th Indian Division during its brilliant encircling movement, which resulted in the capture of Tidip. They were used in a very versatile way, you know. They could do all sorts of things. They were good uh, load carriers. They could uh, fly slowly enough to drop parachutists, to snatch gliders and pick up gliders, and all that sort of thing. No praise is too high for the RAF. Flying through mist and cloud above the jungle, in among the mountains and valleys, with the utmost regularity and precision, they dropped food, ammunition and equipment without which the plan could never have succeeded. Oh, they were quite fast enough. And in fact, the fact that they could fly slowly under control was very valuable for parachutists and, and towing gliders. And um, they were called by the Americans, they were called the C-47. And some wag, I remember, uh, raised the point, he said, I suppose the Americans called them the C-47 because uh, whenever you look at the clock, they're doing 147 miles an hour. And was extraordinary. When you look at the clock, they're nearly all with they're doing uh, 147. Do you have any idea how many Dakotas were used in those operations? Uh, we started off with 130. It was very pleasant to fly, it was allowable, it did the job, it could do all sorts of things, very rarely let anybody down, it could continue on one engine if it wasn't too heavily loaded. This was a dear old thing. Dear old thing it might have been, but a browse through Jimmy Edwards' RAF logbook reveals another side to memories. This entry recalls the moment he most remembers, shot down southeast of Nijmegen. It was a disgrace really, but you see we were at 10,000 feet We'd done our job, we dropped the supplies. We thought fighter command were there, so we relaxed, put George in, and even unstrapped, and then called for the coffee and the sandwiches, and uh, having a little, I'm not gonna say picnic, but just relaxing, and suddenly I saw this airplane go by, zoom like that, and he was firing at us, and he had a black cross on his side. And I remembered him from the little books we had on aircraft recognition. Then panic, take George out, scream fighters to the chaps, and my, nav my wireless operator goes into the um, Astrodome and on the intercom tells me what's going on. I can't see the pilot, but I could see him after he finished his attack, he went by and he came round again. Eventually, when the engines caught fire, when everything was finished and, and the, the chaps who were at the back there were unable to bail out, I opened the hatch here and I stood on the seat, held the stick in one hand and landed it with my head sticking out through the escape hatch. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I did it. I didn't land it, I just, it was a controlled crash. Put it that way, there was no power. I just held it off the ground until it hit these trees and crashed. Then, as it hit the trees, it went right up on its nose and I hung on. It went right up on its nose vertically and then fortunately, instead of going over that way, it came back this way and I was thrown through the roof and onto the ground and ran from my life. After the war, when many expected the DC-3 would become obsolete, the plane instead became a vital part in the most colossal air operation in history, the Berlin Airlift. 
after years of fighting and scratching and looking for work, suddenly a grateful government said, fly all the hours you can and we'll pay you. And we actually got paid at the end of the day. It was marvellous. For better or for worse, having decided to become an airline operator, the only type you could buy really were DC-3s because that was all that was for sale. And they were going for about two and a half thousand quid each from the Ministry of Supply, believe it or not. And there was a beautiful lady called Miss Petty, who was about 90, and she was responsible for selling them, as I think I told you. And um, I couldn't afford two and a half thousand quid, so she said, well, I've got one you can have for 250 quid, but it isn't a very good one. And that was the understatement of the, of the century, because it had no wings, no wheels, no engines, nothing inside. So I bought that one. And then I lived in it, I made it my home. And being a very clever chap, I lowered it down onto the ground so that it laid flat on the floor, and then I was able to work on it without any ladders or stands or trestles. And it was my home, I lived in it for nine months. You know, people used to walk by and say, who's the nutcase living in the aeroplane? They used to come in and see me, like on a Saturday, you know, people used to bring their children to see the man who lived in the plane. The story of how Mike Keegan established his airline was the basis of a TV drama series. It seems ironic that the plane which made a real-life fortune for Keegan in the 50s should still be providing a good living for the firm which hired out their Dakotas for the filming of his story some 30 years later. I would think the aircraft is about as desirable as it was in 1935 when it came out. There's still the uh, same sort of demand throughout the world. What sort of price would it fetch? Uh, probably what it cost new, around 120,000 US dollars. And what about the future? Are we going to see them carrying on? And what about spares? Doesn't the thing in the end fall apart? Well, they've predicted that for the last 30 years, but um, so far there's never been any structural failures on the aircraft. There's no limitations on the fatigue life of it, and spares are plentiful. What's it like to fly? It's an interesting aeroplane to fly. It keeps you on your toes. It's um, in a crosswind situation. Uh, you've got to work at it. And um, the aircraft is a little heavy on the ailerons, but um, on the elevator and rudder, it's very responsive, bearing in mind that it's uh, coming up for 50 years old, it's, uh, it's quite a ship. Right, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Duxford, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this, the second meeting of Friends of the DC-3, which coincides with us being one year old this month. Uh, we're very grateful to all at Duxford, particularly Edward Inman, David Lee, 80s High. Well, everybody... to start with, it's got, it's got propellers. It's got a lovely line, body line, and I, and I feel that I think it will still be flying when, I, when I'm probably under the ground. Mm. That's the sort of fanaticism which brings together these friends of a DC-3. They come from all over the country just to be with the plane, to talk about it, to buy mementos, knickknacks, kits, pictures, anything to remind them of an important day in their lives. Which is something about it, you know, the design and all that, you know, even from when I was a uh, childhood, like, you know, it's um, just stuck there, you know, I've seen it and I've been interested ever since, like, you know, and I've seen them coming into Birmingham a lot, and uh, it's just stuck with me. You come 150 miles just to see a plane. What do your friends think of you? Oh, they think we're mad, absolutely mad, <laughs> but we would, we'd travel anywhere, you know, yeah, we've travelled all over the country, we'd go anywhere to the day see through. Yeah. For a first anniversary, a cake, and no need to guess what was iced on the top. It was a mad rush to get the vital bits. Well, can I have a bit of the engine on? <laughs> Wonderful aircraft, and the Pratt & Whitney Twin Wasp is an excellent engine. And I think it's an excellent aircraft altogether, and the airframe on it is wonderful. And it's a marvellous workhorse, and I hope it just keeps on flying for years and years and years. I think it's the number ones well, first aircraft, and I think it's still number world's number one. There was a, a service, I think it was Eastern Airways, and it came over our place every night at 8 o'clock. And um, whatever we were doing, we would drop and run out, and I'm sure the neighbours all thought we were mad, but uh, we always saw the Dakota go over. If someone gave you the opportunity to fly in Concorde or a DC-3, which would you choose? I would choose a DC-3, because it's got propellers. As far as I'm concerned, jet jets aren't aircraft. I spent two years flying these things, and I got to really know them and like them. And it's just exactly as it was. Everything is the same. They've got this wheel instead of a, a joystick like single-engine aeroplanes. And it's got everything in the right place. You taxied along in this attitude with the nose up, 
But the minute you opened the throttles on the runway, the tail came up in a few yards and along you went and just eased it off the ground. The easiest aeroplane I think ever made to fly. I'd been flying Wellingtons, which was a twin engine bomber. I'd actually been learning to drop torpedoes on a Wellington. And that wasn't quite so easy to fly. This one came second nature. Once you'd read the handbook and learnt the speeds at which it all happened, you, only an idiot can make a bad landing in one of these. <laughs> I made several. These days, there are some 500 DC-3s winging their way somewhere around the world, 10 of them here in Britain, alternating between passenger and cargo. Two Dakotas that have lasted the test of time belong to Harvest Air, who have a base here at South End. This one, Papa Zulu, is being kitted out for its new role in the 80s, pollution control. This one came second nature. Once you'd read the handbook and learnt the speeds at which it all happened, you, only an idiot can make a bad landing in one of these. <laughs> I made several. These days, there are some 500 DC-3s winging their way somewhere around the world, 10 of them here in Britain, alternating between passenger and cargo. Two Dakotas that have lasted the test of time belong to Harvest Air, who have a base here at South End. This one, Papa Zulu, is being kitted out for its new role in the 80s, pollution control. The DC-3 here will have three large tanks installed inside it that we've had manufactured. Uh, all the pumping gear is inside, just the boom for spraying, the same as on the rest of our crop spraying aeroplanes, etc., is mounted at the rear underneath. It's the only thing that should change the characteristics of the aeroplane. With our experience over the last few years in oil pollution, which is what we want the aircraft for, it seems ideal. It's an aeroplane that can stand and still be called upon at any time and still be reliable. Should we have a problem with it, it's the sort of aeroplane we can fix that problem and not be on the ground too long. It's not sophisticated. We're not going to get held up. And we think it'll suit ideally the purpose we've picked them for. You've got to think about uh, economics in terms of how often is it going to be used and uh, against how much it costs you to buy it. Now, we can't tell when there's going to be a major oil spill when we'll be using it. But um, it's not particularly economical in terms of aviation spirit. It's very expensive now, and it does use a fair amount. But um, in terms of outlay and the fact, you know, depreciation, things like that, it's really ideal for our purpose at the moment. When was the last time you piloted a DC-3? Last year, in, in Queensland, Australia, I landed at a place called Cairns, and I saw I flew one in Rhodesia two or three years ago. You can see them in the Caribbean, and also I saw some in, the, in Port Moresby last year, but they weren't flying. They got grass growing around the wheels. They use them in Australia and New Zealand for dropping fertilizer on crops, you know. Mm. And it doesn't surprise you that it's lasted? I'm sad that it's been reduced to dropping fertilizer, of all things. <laughs> I, you know what I mean by that. But it doesn't, it, when you see how well it's made, they'll fly forever. Do you know the chap told me in Queensland, the only thing that'll ground him might be the cost of petrol. Because petrol is more expensive than paraffin. The whole, the rest of it will fly forever. Do you think it'll be flying in 50 years' time? Sure, I'm absolutely certain. I remember when I was very, very young, and I'd just started off, I don't know, very young, 25 or so, and I, I suddenly heard the news that the DC-3 was to be grounded because of its old age. So this is, what, 20-odd years ago. 
and I hurtled up to London and I raced into the office of this guy who was then the senior surveyor, a guy called Norman of the CIA, and breathlessly I said, Mr. Norman, Mr. Norman, is it true that they're going to ground the DC-3? And he looked at me and he said, young man, he said, it'll see me off. And how old are you? And I said, 24. And he said, and it'll see you off. And it looks like it will. In fact, I'm certain it will. DC-3 force landed um, on a glacier in Switzerland and the people walked down the mountain and were rescued and they later went back to the aircraft and found it was actually sinking into the ice. And they put a time capsule in through the uh, hatch in the roof and the thing has now sunk into the ice and it's estimated that it'll come out intact at the bottom of the glacier in 600 years time. So there'll still be one around in 600 years. <laughs> In 51, they tried to ground the noble DC-3 And so some lawyers brought the case before the CAB Well, the board examined all the facts behind their great oak portal And then pronounced these simple words, the Goonie Bird's immortal They, they patch her up with masking tape, with paper clips and strings And still she flies, she never dies, Methuselah with wings Now she flies the feeder routes and carries mail and freight. She's just an airborne office or a flying 12-ton crate. They patch her up with masking tape, with paper clips and strings. And still she flies, she never dies, Methuselah with wings. They patch her up with masking tape, with paper clips and strings. And still she flies, she never dies, Methuselah with wings.